This is Clinton Callahan in San Rafael talking with Lion Goodman of Luminary Leadership Institute. Institute. And I'm going to kind of just give you a chance to find out who Lion Goodman is and the kind of work that he does through his own words. So, Lion, thank you very much for being with us here today. Thanks. With a next great, great surprise. Thank you. <laughs> Could you just, for the first few minutes, just tell us a little bit about what your work, what are you, your path, what have you been doing? Oh, the path is long and uh, and curvy, but uh, <laughs> but it's it's led me to tr a truly purposeful life. Uh, so everything I do is in alignment with my life purpose, and my life purpose is about awakening and awakening playfully. So uh, my, my goal and desire is to awaken people to their full potential, to the infinite possibilities that they are and can be in the world. And it's not just the spiritual greatness, it's also in the world greatness. It's also contributing to a, a new world, to, the, to heaven on earth, which is what we'd like to see. So um, the Luminary Leadership Institute is kind of the, the, the broad... A structure for all of my initiatives, um, many of which are with my partner, Krista Luminaire. And so uh, the, the Luminary Leadership Institute has a, a year-long initiatory program primarily designed for leaders and high achievers that uh, takes them into the depths of themselves, into their, uh, into their shadow material, into, the, into getting to know themselves in all aspects, their beliefs, their identities, their emotions, their their thoughts, their future goals, their dreams, uh, and also their legacy and their own life purpose. So that's a long-term process. We do it in stages and customize it to each individual. What have you discovered in terms of what it takes for somebody to become adult? We talked briefly about initiation. And um, in my work with men over the last 30 years, what we see is that uh, initiation is is a transition from one state to another. It's it's a uh, like a bridge that takes you from where you were to where you want to go. And uh, all ancient cultures had initiations for their their children and their teenagers to take them into the area of adults. We missed out on that. In the American culture, we have uh, maybe a bar mitzvah if you're Jewish. Uh, you get your driver's license. You get to have sex and drink beer for the first time. And those are not initiations. And, and it's said that, that if you don't initiate the young men, they will burn the village down. And that's what we have. We have a, a burning village where the whole world is burning with the, with the, the fierceness of, of our children. And so kids get together and they create gangs in order to, to initiate themselves. And they can't initiate themselves. So we've lost these initiation uh, traditions. And so in, in our tribe of men, we created our own initiation ceremony that initiated men, not into manhood because they were already men, but into a tribe that had principles, that had, had principles that you could live your life by. And so part of the initiation is to, uh, to move from one state to another, to elevate into the next state of maturity and the ability to deal with this crazy world that we've got because it's all crazy. We are all crazy. And the world is crazy. We have to acknowledge that, that the way the world is structured is nuts and that we're, we're trying to be sane in an in a insane culture. So uh, we have to elevate our awareness and expand our perspective in order to see reality. Because when you're buried in it, when you're, when you're swimming in it, you can't get enough perspective to step out of it and go, is that really what I want? Is that really the culture I want, the family I want, the civilization I want? Do I want to live in this kind of culture? Because the, the ideal is that we could live on, in heaven. We could have heaven here on earth. We could create a beautiful society. And we have all the technology. We have the know-how. The, the, the information's there. So the question is, how do we awaken enough to say, oh, I am in a pile of crap <laughs> And there is something more possible. There's something more that is possible, and I can help create it in my own life and for my family and community. So that's that's what I'm about. That's what my work is about. This process of gaining the ability to choose what culture you live in, being able to, I use the phrase, hold space 
for a, a consciously chosen culture, how does somebody gain that capacity? Ah, well, the, 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 the Greeks had on, on top of uh, one of their buildings the words know thyself, and that's where it starts. So you, we can seek outside ourselves all we want, but until you turn the searchlight inside, you, you're going to keep living out of the same belief structure that you were indoctrinated into. So my work with beliefs is to have people examine, you know, what, what do I believe about this? What do I believe about people? What do I believe about life? What do I believe about myself? And to examine and to pull up those beliefs from the subconscious mind and really look at them and say, this, did I create this myself or was it programmed into me? Uh, do I still want it? Is it helpful to me, beneficial, or is it detrimental to me? Oh, it's detrimental. I'm going to get rid of that belief structure of who I am or what I'm supposed to do or what life is supposed to be about. And I'm going to, what do I want to create? Because it's said that we create our reality Being in and, and looking at all of them. You can see this is how I'm seeing the world through my beliefs. And I can change that out to a new set of filters and actually have the experience of life that I really want. So that's where, that's where I start with people. You, you just brought up a, a touchy subject that I wasn't planning to talk about, but I'd like to ask you about, because when a person examines their beliefs and takes out some old belief and puts in a new belief, uh, people who don't understand the evolutionary maturing process or the transformational process that's involved in initiation um, start tending to immediately get afraid of a cult or a sect. And so how can you explain the difference between what you're doing and a cult or a sect? Very easily. Um, if I tell you what to believe, I'm a cult leader. If I ask you, what would you prefer to believe? What experience do you want to have? What, how do you want to experience the world? Then I'm, I'm actually empowering you to make your own choices. So if I ever tell any of my students what to believe, I, I say, back off, <laughs> you know, don't, don't follow me because I'm as lost as you are, in one says. But, but if, I, if we inquire together and say, what, how does this belief serve you? Or how do, is this a belief that you really want to keep or the one you want to let go of? That's, that's in every question we ask. Is it's, a, it's about empowering you to decide what you want to believe because that's your power, is your choice. Your choice and your power is where you place your attention. And a lot of people don't get their, don't get training in how to manage their attention. And so their attention's all over the place and they don't have any power because they're, they're split attention or they're distracted or they're multitasking. They're all over the place. And so power comes from being able to focus your attention and move it in a certain way. So you get to choose where you put your attention. If I'm telling you where you should put your attention, which is what we do to children all the time, attend here, focus here, look at your book. Don't, don't move, don't get up, don't, don't be creative, don't be drawing when I'm talking to you. Then we're, we're stripping them of their will. And we even, we even say that a willful child is an obstinate child, right? So we, we are removing the will from children instead of encouraging them to create their own power, to have their own power in, in their lives. So we retrain people how to grab the hold of their will and decide for themselves. You know, we were, for the most part, born and raised in a patriarchal empire culture, both men and women. And since it's like a fish doesn't see the water it's swimming in, we don't see the culture we were born and raised in, our birth culture, for what it is. And from, the, from your experience being functioning in a different culture, in a, a more mature culture, in a next culture we call it an archiarchy, the culture that comes after patriarchy, what, when you look back at the cost of being a man in the patriarchy or the cost of being a woman in the patriarchy. Could you just describe that? And yeah, first of all, um, if we if we look at at the big picture at politics and civilization, we can see that civilizations were created by strong men, big strong men, who at least in the last five thousand years, um, who gathered a bunch of bullies around them and then enforced his will on other people. Uh, and gave them choices like you can pay your taxes in cash or by check. Uh, 
<laughs> so th that's like what we think of as choice, right? You can choose from among 50 brands of soap. And so our whole idea of choice is, is really about, you know, what do I get to buy? And we don't, we, we haven't examined the entire structure of even capitalism and ownership. You know, we, you have to start taking all of these ideas apart and looking at them and saying, what, what is patriarchy made of? Patriarchy is made of power and control uh, and in order to move wealth up to the top. And uh, I don't know if you've studied this, but you know, when you look at wealth distribution in the US, people think, well, it's kind of like this, you know, that from the poverty to the wealthiest people, it's actually like this. And the wealthiest have, you know, the wealthiest 1% has 80% of the wealth in this country. That's imbalanced, it's not sustainable. But, you know, the patriarchy works if that's the kind of world you want to create. So before patriarchy, there was, there was matriarchy for a long time and matriarchy had its problems. The women, I think women should be more in charge than men. I think, we, I think that would be a make a better world. But even better than that is, is partnership. So um, I, don't, I don't know how you see archiarchy, but the way I see it is it's a partnership model. Uh, you know, you have queens and kings operating co-equally with each other. Uh, in my partnerships with, with the with Carista and my former partnership with Anadea, we were co-equally creating, we were co-creating. And I think all creation is co-creation. You know, we were creating a film together, right? You can't do it alone, you can't do anything alone. So in partnership form, it's like we have, we are supporting each other, we are modeling for each other, we are calling each other on our BS in order to elevate our consciousness. So if, if we're in partnership and I, uh, and you do something that hurts me, I've got to let you know, hey, that hurt me. Now, in the patriarchy model, it's like, that's too bad. You know, it's like, I'm going to suppress your feelings. I don't care about your feelings because it's about my power and you're here to support my power. Now, power relationships are really good for things. Hierarchy is really good for some things. Like in an emergency, you want to have a clear hierarchy and somebody tells you what to do so the emergency gets taken care of. You know, military organizations have to be hierarchical, although they're becoming less so in the U.S. But you know, there are certain things that hierarchy is really good for. It's not really good for people or civilization. You know, it's it's really good for moving power and getting things done. Even businesses are starting to look at, you know, how can we be less hierarchical and more collaborative? So um, there there is a movement. There is a movement toward a collaborative model, a cooperative model, a co-creative model and and that's where we need to go because you know one on top of the other is you know it's worked to create what we've got both good and bad you know, capitalism's created more wealth than, than religion ever has but on the other hand it's concentrated wealth at the top and made for a lot of poor people so that's that's some of my ideas when you mentioned this king and queen you mentioned the man accessing a part of himself that's the kingly part, mm -hmm. and um, woman accessing the queenly part, and then this kind of a collaboration, and and uh, a a team, a cooperation, a so a partnership. So, what what is the experience of that? Well, um, it's actually glorious when it works. You know, when when you're uh, creating with a partner and the partnership is mutually supportive, it elevates the whole package. It, it, it elevates both people to a new level. So, um, so many, all, everything is relational. You know, from the time we're born, we, we have these relational brains. We're trying to figure out from our parents, how, what is love? You know, we're all confused about love because love looks like what our parents did, mm -hmm. but they were confused by their parents and they were confused by their parents. So, you know, so we have to reprogram and rewire each other to, to learn these new ways. But when you, when you are in cooperation and collaboration with another and it's mutually supportive, both people get elevated. The whole community gets elevated. So, so that's what we're after is, you know, how do I, in a, in a community setting, how do I support and elevate and empower you and you and you and you so that all Everyone gets empowered, everyone gets elevated, everyone gets supported and raised up. 
Now, the old tribal cultures were most likely like this, that, that, that everyone served the community as a whole. Individualism was not so much known or, or used. It's like every once in a while someone would leave the tribe. But for the most part, you grew up in the tribe, you found your role in the tribe, you, you did your role in the tribe, and you supported the tribe. And that was what life was about. Now we've split up into, in, you know, from, ex from communities to extended families and extended families to nuclear families, nuclear families to single parent families. It's gotten worse at every level because we're, we're splitting up. We need each other. We are communal creatures. We are troop creatures. We're, we're supposed to be part of a group, not, not individuals, not rugged individuals out there. So the whole idea of the rugged individual in, in, in the U.S. Is, is really bunk um, because you can't do anything alone. So, so all of these forces are moving to, to encourage us to find ways of collaborating and find ways of working together in a new way that's not hierarchical, but it's also not chaos. So there are certain structures that if you bring into a system, whether it's two people or a group of people, there are structures for success, structures that if you use these structures, you can build co collaboration that really works. The problem is most people, when they leave hierarchy, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. They throw the rules out with, and the, and the structures out with hierarchy, and they go, let's just collaborate. Let's just be cool together. Let's, let's, let's have consensus. And it turns into chaos, and nothing gets done. <laughs> because you need structures in order to make that work. Can you talk about some of those structures? Sure, sure. Um, uh, you know, meetings are a, are a good way of approaching things, because meetings often turn into awful experiences for a lot of people. So th there are, so when there's a facilitator who understands collaboration and the collaboration model, they say, okay, this is the agenda. These are the processes we're going to use at each stage. We want to make sure everybody's aligned with it, that no one gets left out. And this is the process we'll use to handle each of these pieces of business. And when, it, when a business is well run that way, it just sings because because most people dig in their heels and get obstinate when they're, they're, what they care about isn't being taken care of. So if the attitude is we everybody gets taken care of, nothing will be decided until we're all good, and as long as it, as long as it takes, we're going to be here. We're going to work through the process so that we all get our needs taken care of because we get representatives from all the different stakeholders here in the meeting. So that's. That's part of the, the structure called the collaborative operating system. And, that, and then you get a lot done. So the, the traditional way is a dis, the hierarchical decision maker decides what's going to happen. And then it takes this long to make it happen because everybody's you know, pissed off and, and the, you know, they, it's the don't row theory. It's like, well, I'm not going to row if he's not going to row. <laughs> and everything slows down to a stop and, and then the manager has to beat on people to get them to do things. Well, the collaborative model, you take much longer to make a decision because you want to get everybody on board. And, and so then once you make the decision because everybody's on board and everybody's concerns are cared for, then it only takes this long to do it because there's no resistance. So you actually save 40% of the time to get the same amount of things done because you just eliminate the resistance because everybody's on board. So that's an example of, of the collaborative operating system, part of what we teach. Yeah, how, do, how, do, uh, how do people shift from a lifelong hab habitual reactions and habitual uh, relationships with, with each other, men, women, or boss and employee, or that kind of thing, parent child like how do they shift to um the new practices how do they shift to from a hierarchy to a circle or a galaxy how do they how do they move energy around in a different way um, how do they learn those things well we have to start with with what's at the core of the subconscious mind so i always i always look in first you know, it's like what's what's on the inside and how does it manifest on the outside so if we go to the core of every every individual Everyone wants to hear, every baby who's born wants to hear these words from its mother and its father. You know, welcome. I love you. I'm here for you. I will protect you and I will support you. And I recognize you as a whole and unique individual. And you can't control things now, but you will learn how to control your body and you'll learn how to speak and you'll learn all these things. And I'm going to be here every step of the way. And if you need me, I will be here. And if you don't need me, I will let you be by yourself and I'll teach you and help you learn these things. And I will hold you and I will protect you and keep you safe. 
and love you exactly as you are and exactly as you are not. Now, everyone wants to hear that. Every single person. And when you relate to another person that way, their limbic system can relax. Our limbic system is like an alarm system, right? It's the, the amygdala works like a smoke alarm and a fire alarm. Smoke alarm is something, something's dangerous. I don't know what it is, but I'm not feeling good. And then when it goes off, the fire alarm goes, get out, get out, get out. <laughs> so the, once that happens, the cortex is offline. So all you can do is react to the panic that you're feeling when the limbic system is on alarm. So what we teach is how to rewire the brain using techniques like nonverbal communication, like nonverbal, what we call the love languages. So some people it's touch. How you doing? You okay? Some, it's, for some people it's eye gazing. I'm here for you. And some people it's the tone of voice. It's going to be okay. Now you look around any corporate center or any group of people and half the people, their alarm systems are going off. I'm not safe. I don't know what's going on. I'm confused. I can't, you know, and so they're, they're in a limbic reaction instead of in thoughtful action. So we train people how to get, how to recognize those signs in each other and get their limbic systems to quiet down. And then once the limbic system's quieted down, then you can have a conversation <laughs> about what needs to be done. <laughs> but when somebody's in react mode, forget about it. You're, you're just dealing with the reaction. So that's, that's at the core of any change is, is that we were trained by our parents how to be in relationship in this funky way. You know, the parent was, was narcissistic or was you know, too busy for you and you're kind of going, ah, you know, I'm, I'm panicked. So there's all this insecure attachment. We teach attachment theories, which is what, what it all comes from. But, you know, kids grow up insecure and they're always trying to find a secure, they're trying to find their security. So they go to an addiction or they go to a relationship or they go to, you know, service. So they go, they go into some strategy for getting that need met, that core need met. And once you teach people how to meet the core needs of each other, then everything else just is much easier. You know, the women's liberation movement kind of started in the 60s, and it never stopped. And the men's liberation movement is maybe starting. So the women are way ahead of the men. And, and a lot of women are feeling, where are the men? You know, they've done their work and they're, and they're healing the wounds and getting their power back and getting their original impulses, their original motivation back for being, being a person in the world, a woman in the world, and they're looking for a partner and they're looking for, you know, a collaborator in the men. And the men are still adolescent, identified with patriarchy, identified with macho, surviving, identifying with a bank account or their car or their computer or their watch or their mobile phone or whatever, you know, and so how do you, first of all, how do you, how do you, how do you get the men up to speed with the women? Well, we're doing the best we can. <laughs> Every, everything I do for men is all about that, is about raising men's awareness, intelligence, emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence. Um, and we are doing the best we can. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was the director of men's programs for the Shift Network. We put on the Ultimate Men's Summit, and we had 20,000 people register for that summit with 90 speakers, uh, you know, about the men's movement. So, you know, I'm doing my part, doing the best I can. I'm, you know, pushing the rock up the hill as fast as possible. Um, the, the statistics are unfortunate for women. Um, if you read Paul Ray's Cultural Creatives, you know, he talks about the fact that the cultural creatives, which is 26% of the population, have these values of, the, of green and consciousness and, and you know, growth, spiritual, spirituality, uh, environmentalism, you know, sort of the liberal values. But, and and it's, the populations are spread like population is normally spread, but it's twice as many women as men. And it's just unfortunate. It just part of it is the fact that women got started earlier and they've got 20 years on us, you know, of, of developing women's consciousness and men are still behind. You know, men are caught up in the role of uh, all the roles that men are supposed to be in. 
<clears throat> women are more aware. They know that they have more, more chances and more options. And women are now way ahead of men in most categories, including education and, and getting jobs and all the rest. Um, you know, men have been used as fodder, as cannon fodder, or as uh, production fodder. You know, for for our centuries, and we haven't woken up yet. And it's just, you know, it's all about awakening. How do we awaken people? Well, you can't awaken somebody who doesn't want to be awakened, or they will string you up and <laughs> nail you to a cross, or you know, or kill you, or do one of the things that that happens. You know, so we have to just keep at it. We have to do two things. One is do as much awakening process as we can of the population. And the other is build our institutions, the new institutions, the, the new archiarchy uh, uh, at the same time. Because for example, you, you, people didn't have to be convinced to give up their landlines to have cell phones. Cell phones were such a better advance. They were such a, a better idea that they got one even if they had a landline. And then some people didn't have, don't even have the landlines anymore because cell phones are such a good idea. Tablet computing didn't have to be, people didn't have to be convinced to give up their typewriters to get computers or computers or their tablets. So we need to create the same things in the social institution realm, something that's so much better that other people go, wow, how do I get some of that? <laughs> what do I need to do to get there? <laughs> so. That's what I. That's what we're doing in, in trying to build our own institutions and our, our teachings. It's all dedicated to that. You know, how do we use the the wealth and the intelligence that we have to create something new? So, what is it like to be partnered with a woman who is a queen? Like, what do you get out of that? What is your? Tell us some of it. You know, let us give us a little hint about what it's like on the other side over there to be real partners. Well, I've been, uh, I've been very blessed to be in wonderful relationships with very powerful, creative women uh, my whole life. Now, part of it's, that's who I'm attracted to, right? And so, so it's never been an ego issue. It's like I don't think of them as something other than me or in competition with me. So it's like we're, we're in this together. We're on this path together. And how do we go there together? So uh, part of it is just the attitude toward the relationship. But um, what it's like is, is uh, fantastic because you have someone standing next to you walking in the same direction. And awakening has to happen with two or more, or two or more gathered. <clears throat> Even the Buddha talked about the Sangha. You know, he said, when it's, it's possible to awaken, but as soon as you awaken, you fall back asleep. And so if you and I are in partnership, I'll awaken at one moment and go, hey, wake up, I see you're asleep. And then you go, oh, now I'm awake, great. And then as soon as you are awake, I'm, I'm back asleep. So you have to wake me up. So community, the community of, of awakened beings is very important. And at least in a partnership, you have each other to awaken. <clears throat> so is it perfect all the time? No, sometimes it's really hard because we, re we react to each other. We have a bonding pattern that, you know, I remind her of, her father and then she reacts like a child to me and that reminds me of my mother and then I'm reacting more like my father. So those bonding patterns, you know, we, we experience them, but then we look at it and go, oh, there we, we got caught again. You know, let, how can we repair and restore as quickly as possible, get back to a place of harmony and love and mo keep moving forward. So we forgive each other easily and we, you know, we get past those things. Um, so it's not like it's suddenly all roses and unicorns. You know, it's hard work. Relationships are hard work. And working relationships, developmental relationships are hard work. You have to really work at them. And so, uh, so when, both, when that permission is there for both people to call each other on their stuff, it's like, oh, wait, ooh, that hurt me. Instead of just going off and sulking, I can now stand in that and go, that really hurt. I don't like it. And I don't want that to happen again. What do we need to, what do, we need to do? in order to have it not happen again. So it's a we, it's always a we conversation. Before, if you're in a standard relationship, it's like, what are my needs? Are my needs getting met? Oh, you have needs too? That's a surprise. <laughs> so narcissism is like, you're here for me. What do you mean you have needs? I don't even understand what that means. And being a recovering narcissist, I can, I can speak from authority. You know, so, so it's really, it's the question of, of the we as, as primary and your needs are as important as mine and how do we satisfy our needs? 
And when you're doing that, you're constantly elevating each other. You say, what's it like? It's like being on a, on a constantly elevating ladder, elevating in consciousness and love and, and, uh, and care and going deeper at the same time you're going higher. So that's what it's like. It's like it's glorious. Can you speak about that kind of a collaborative relationship, a partner relationship in community, in a community of other partners and collaborators? Well, um, I, I've been a member of many different communities, and um, uh, Brother David Steindelrast, who's a Benedictine monk, uh, talked about spiritual community, and he said, you know, if you put a rock in a rock tumbler and you turn it on, it just kind of rattles around, nothing much happens. If you put two rocks in there, they both rattle around, but every once in a while they bump into each other and a rough edge gets knocked off. You put a whole bunch of rocks in the rock tumbler, and pretty soon they're all, they're all bumping into each other, rubbing the rough edges off until they all get rubbed smooth. He said that's what spiritual community is. <laughs> so, so you know, any community that's committed to this practice is, is going to experience the bumps, right? And the more people you have, the more bumps there will be. And if there's a commitment to, to working with them, to not reacting to them, but working with what comes up, then you have a constantly empowered community, constantly empowered individuals, constantly empowered community, family, you know, extended family, and everybody gets elevated. And, and so, you know, some communities have a guru at the top, and then you get this hierarchical thing. And for some people that works, and other people it doesn't. I, I'm not one of those people that, that does well with somebody telling me what to believe or, or what to do. Um, but for some people, they need that father figure or mother figure in order to, to do their, that part of their growth. But when people are committed to growing together, it's, it's a glorious thing. What is your positive or hopeful vision for the future of humanity? Mm. Well, I, I just attended a conference called Wisdom 2.0, and it was about the coming together of technology and spiritual communities and c companies that are trying to do things with more compassion and more wisdom. And it actually gave me some hope. Um, as an example, the head of the chairman of Ford Motor Company, uh, Bill Ford, spoke, uh, and uh, and he talked about how compassion is what his primary focus is. You're going, wow, an old style company like Ford Motor Company using compassion? That's like weird, you know. <laughs> but it's also hopeful. So so he sees the entire company as as his community that he's there to take care of, and he hates laying people off because. He knows the families, and some of the families have been with the company five generations. So even in old-style corporations, there is a movement toward a more compassionate and wise um, possibility. And so, so it gave me some hope because I see the environmental degradation going on, and the, it's like we're, we're head, heading right toward a, a huge disaster area uh, in, in our, as a planet. And so I have a lot of fear about what it's, what it's going to be and how bad it's going to be. And, and my concern is it's sort of like a race to, to survival, a race to uh, whether we, we actually take off and go upward or head downward. Um, you know, my fear is that millions of people will die, maybe tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of people will die. Uh, potentially billions of people may die in, in this transition we're going to go through. And my prayer is that it's as small as possible, you know, that, that we have, you know, but as the seas rise, we're going to have 400 million environmental refugees who are looking for another place to live. And when you have your territory and your food sources, you don't want to share with a couple tens of millions of people coming into your territory. So it, it could be really messy. So the, the potential of, of changes, the potential of, of disaster are huge and my hope is that whatever happens however that transition occurs that the pockets of new possibilities will will spring up whether it's out of a big disaster or kind of a series of smaller disasters and and that these new forms will come up and flower and people will be attracted to them and and you know we create a community based on our principles and our our way and if you want to come into the community you have to be initiated so that you take on our way which is loving and compassionate and, and wise and dedicated to personal growth and you know, no hiding and no taking advantage of people. And you know, so 
I assume that the earliest religions were like this. And they asked the questions, how can we live together better? How can we function together better? How can we support each other better? And so they began asking, what are the principles that make life work, that make relationships work, that make community work? Now, that was good, but then the principles became rules, and then rules became laws, and then laws became enforce, enforceable. And so then you needed a bunch of bullies to make sure people followed the laws and the rules and punished those that didn't. And it got worse and worse, you know. And so that's part of the patriarchy and the hierarchy. It's part of what happened. So if we go all the way back to the principles and say, what are the principles and the structures that make relationships work and that make community work? That's the key. So if we can find that, if we can ask that question and find the answers to those questions, we'll, we'll do all right.